right, so uh, a little background on this talk that's coming up, uh, which again is done by another duo, I think. Are you guys collaborating company? Yeah, yeah okay. So I was thinking back uh, many years ago to when I was first being interviewed here uh, for Sims Directive, which by the way was the toughest interview that I had ever done. Uh, um, and part of that was actually sitting with Paul and uh, <laughs> I don't remember being that tough. I remember <laughs> that really tough. Uh, you and, uh, oh, what's his name from CSU? Just mentioned his name earlier. Uh, who to... No, 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 no. no. Perno. Jim Perno. We're in the room. Yeah, it was tough. It was tough. <laughs> it was tough. And Brent's president was in there too. Um, and, you know, the discussion then was microwave remote sensing. It was in the building both in SIMS and within AOS, uh, people were leaving. And so the expertise with regard to microwave remote sensing uh, was dwindling and the importance of rebuilding that up. Um, and so that's always been in the back of my mind. Um, and as we looked at this symposium and doing this, I suddenly realized again, particularly with regard to AOS, the expertise with regard to microwave remote sensing and precipitation in general has skyrocketed uh, during that time. And I don't take any credit for this, by the way. But, uh, it's just a nice way that it worked out. And so I thought it would be really good uh, to bring in uh, both Ralph and uh, Mark here, who are not only experts in microwave, but are actually moving into a really important direction in terms of research that's going to impact us and the building in general. Uh, and that's with regard to precipitation. So I each asked them to give a talk, and they said, how about we combine it? to do it as a pair again. And I thought, well, that sounds great. So it looks like they're going to have two talks back to back and call it one, as opposed to <laughs> Tim and Paul, who actually got up here. We won't be debating either. You won't be debating either? No. Can people hear? I'm going to try this microphone because I tend to wander and look at the screen. So Ralph and I are going to split this talk, and we're going to talk about exploring new frontiers in microwave remote sensing. And the background, if you can make that out as a snow scene from Wisconsin, a lot of this will be applied to snowfall remote sensing, with a few other tidbits as well. We also have a host of collaborators on here. And like Steve said, he alluded to, I think we now have, a, I kind of call it a microwave nerve center or think tank that has uh, been located or housed here now. So we have a lot of momentum going forward. Our outline is very simple. I will be talking about the first part, and I'll explain what radar CW means, and Ralph will be talking about the next part, taking it all to space. Radar CW will be more of a ground-based theme. And I'm not to blame for this. It's an acronym. It's an acronym of an acronym. And if you know Claire Pedersen, did Claire walk in? I don't know. Hey, Claire. So Claire is intelligent and energetic, as we all know, but she's also creative. And one day came up with this nice acronym of Research and Development Advancing Radar Studies at UW. And as of about 11.45 a.m. today, this became our official group name, or at least a working group name that may be subject to change. But the main theme here is that we have a lot of different observational platforms that we use. And uh, I won't go through all these now because I'll, I'll highlight all these throughout the talk. The bottom line is that we are starting to really take radar in an integrated fashion Combine it with microphysical observations, mostly looking at precipitation, and also integrating modeling aspects, kind of a holistic approach for precipitation retrievals. And again, retrieval development, validation from a ground perspective um, on space, form, space uh, precipitation measurements, also looking at microphysical processes. These are all natural offshoots of some of the things we'll be looking at in the future. So I first want to mention a couple of ground-based observational tools. This is a project that is just starting that was recently funded by NASA. And it's actually taking a microarray radar, which is this little DirecTV satellite-looking unit that actually is a vertically pointing radar. And looking at, this is actually uh, an MRR microarray radar data set from Stefan Kneipel from Germany, who also used one of these to look at snowfall. We're planning on deploying one of these instruments hopefully within the next few months, definitely the next two years, to look at snowfall and get really nice details of the vertical structure of precipitating cases. A 
second component of this observational study will be deploying something called the Snowflake Video Imager, SVI. It's an optical basically taking pictures of snowflakes. On the right here shows a snapshot of ice crystals taken that show you both the ice habit and also the distribution in size of all these different particles. And the nice thing is when you have a radar twin with an observational platform showing you the particle, you can then merge the two together and start modeling the microwave signature of these different types of snowflakes that are common. And the plan for this deployment is actually for the 2012-13 uh, and actually 2013-14, sorry, this is for my proposal. We're already one year behind, 2013-14, 2014-15 deployments. What I'd like to do is actually deploy these instruments up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. There's a, a yellow cross up here and a green cross right here, which are kind of in bullseye areas where we have a high frequency of snowfall, a lot of it due to lake effect snow. And I actually have a, an ongoing collaboration that I'm starting to work with, the Market National Weather Service as well. They're very interested in housing this equipment and helping us out look at some of these snowfall observations. And I, I would be remiss to point out this is a, a picture from my boyhood home in Upper Peninsula that just demonstrates that you can get the same amount of snowfalls in certain locations. So it's definitely an area that will be of high interest for us. And again, just highlighting some of the, the themes for this research are long-term both microphysical data sets and also radar observations in first Eventually, we'd like to look at trying to enhance and improve both modeling aspects and microwave retrievals of snowfall using this data set. And using this as kind of a poor man's observational uh, validation site for NASA missions. So again, this was funded by NASA. And you may be wondering why is NASA interested in, in having a ground-based approach. This is just showing a combined uh, active and passive observation from a multi-frequency passive radiometer showing here an 89 gigahertz channel that actually shows this uh, depression of brightness temperatures in snowfall regions. And this is the main signature, it's a scattering signature that reduces brightness temperatures for passive microwave observations. Also showing a really nice cloud sat uh, overpass on the bottom panel here of this same transect uh, of passive microwave shown by the, the black line. The bottom line is the scattering signature is what keeps a lot of us awake at night because it's very dependent on the type of snowflake, the snow particle, the size of the particle, and the distribution of snowflakes. There's a lot of uncertainties associated with this. So these observations of radar with uh, snowflake shape and size distribution will be very helpful to improve retrievals for spaceborne instruments. A final link in this whole chain as well is Something nice that's been developed by Grant Petty here at UW Madison is actually making models of snowflakes and assessing and computing the scattering properties of these models. And again, this is actually showing a multi-frequency radar data set. This was an analysis done by Mike Kiley here that kind of brings it all back together of why we want to have observations of both radar with the, the actual pre precipitation snowflake type and size distribution together so we can actually assess how these models are realistically performing. Another activity, part of this talk will actually be kind of dreaming and looking forward to the future too. And right now this is a, a dream component of this talk. Uh, actually looking at getting a microwave link set up to actually look really intensely under controlled uh, environments on how to look at backscattering properties and attenuation properties of snowfall. This is actually spearheaded by Grant Petty. And again, it's in the dream phase. And I have a, a little schematic here showing the top of the OSS building here. And under this dream scenario, you would have a transmitter located on top of the building looking at this is the top of Camp Randall. And if we have permission from Barry Alvarez or someone higher up, you put something up here, a reflector <laughs> up on top of the football building, you can then max, measure the backscatter off that reflector. Where this becomes really interesting is if you get snowfall falling through that column and you have this little transmitter and receiver measuring the attenuation of the backscatter, you can actually get really controlled uh, measurements. It's something that we desperately need, need especially at multi-frequencies that are very important to precipitation remote sensing. This type of project would also be enhanced by putting a ground-based measurement like a vertically pointing radar or something to measure the size distribution and the shapes of the particles as well.
been involved with a, a nice collaboration with the electrical and computer engineering department, John Busky, and looking at microwave absorption characteristics. And this is actually some lab measurements that are made. I'm definitely not smart enough to lead you through this. It's definitely an engineering uh, project. But we also uh, helped him assess different attenuation characteristics of water vapor at 400 gigahertz, 400 gigahertz uh, frequencies. This type of laboratory measurement is also, we're looking to extend it to liquid and frozen hydrometeors in the future, again in a very controlled laboratory setting to give us well needed, much needed information for precipitation remote sensing. Shifting gears a little bit, this is another project that we're trying to launch and getting launched very soon under the GIMPAP project. And this is using NEXRAD data and combining them with GOES data. And again, there's a, another common theme here. I'm showing a lake effect snow event by Aqua Modus. And it's a project that we're trying to use both using ground-based uh, observational uh, operational radar with GOES products. And this is with uh, myself, Ralph, Tommy Walter, and Andy Heidegger. Some of our scanning operational radars, there's a, if you know anything about the scanning radars, there's a, there's a big downfall. And looking at this late effect snow event here in the upper peninsula of Michigan, this is a nice radar returns here for this very heavy late effect snow case. Here is, a, I believe, a Terra, a Terra Modus overpass at the same time. And you notice some of these nice signatures showing up in both the visible and the lineup of the radar. But if you look out to the west, there are a lot of features are not captured here by the radar. And this is in an area, I showed you this picture earlier, that gets a lot of snow. This is in inches, 300 inches of snow is a very typical amount seen in some of these areas. So what we're trying to do in this project is calibrate the GOES products using NEXRAD radar. And this is basically done by developing these character relationships between the radar and the GOES products together. The step-by-step -step recipe is to take next rat snowfall rates, which you can derive using some rainfall or snowfall rate to radar reflectivity conversions. You can then calibrate and, and relate these next rat snowfall rate with some of the GOES cloud properties products, and then extend the coverage of radar using the GOES satellite products. So it's very good uh, to see some of the new capabilities of the, the future GOES uh, imagers that was talked about by Tim and Paul show that uh, can definitely help us in this project. And again, this is very strong support from the National Weather Service uh, up in some of the upper Midwest Great Lakes regions. They're very interested in this and will help us do things like validation and uh, general logistics to, to get this project going. And in the future, I think talking with other people in this building, there's definitely a thrust we can do and push this forward to a multi-sensor approach to look at lake effect snowfall from more of a microphysical perspective, merging IR with microwave and now help the tools that we're developing. I would be remiss if I didn't mention this project, and I think this is a slide that Hank might show tomorrow, so I won't spend too much time. But it's an observational data set that we have, our observational suite in Greenland, uh, the, the highest point on Summit Peak in Greenland, called Ice Caps. And it's a, a collaborative effort between a lot of different universities, and it's producing a beautiful data set. From a precipitation remote sensing standpoint, we're actually most interested here in the cloud radar, the ground-based cloud radar, which is another observational tool our group really wants to get into and use. And uh, again, to bring Claire back into this, Claire actually was deployed up here on very short notice for an emergency deployment and actually revived this cloud radar by performing some sort of magic CPR. I don't know what he did, but uh, this radar is up and running very nicely. And in general, I think in the future, our group would really like to use these cloud radars. Most of them are vertically pointing. There are some scanning cloud radars as well. Uh, as direct observational validation using this ice caps data set, also the Department of Energy ARM sites has a suite of cloud radars that has great data. But the dream scenario would be maybe someday having a cloud radar here at UW to help us with all of our, our projects that we're launching. And again, some of the, the advantages of using cloud radars are you get very near surface features that you often miss using either space borne radars or also scanning radars as well increase radar sensitivities to see these light precipitation events that often occur at higher latitudes and a whole host of other things. And I think with that, I'll hand it off to Ralph. We'll move 
emissions, what is happening with you know future active emissions. We have learned so much from CloudSat and also from you know Trim and GPM. So it's very important that as a community we you know start thinking about beyond GPM time. And um, so we are trying to think big and think a little bit outside of the box. Um, one thing that I've been doing over the last couple of years, I've organized a series of workshops. Um, next one is going to come up in May this year, um, where we're trying to form a like core community of people who would then, you know, hopefully be able at some point to submit to now diverse venture type of you know things and um, or even probably bigger missions that wouldn't probably even be enough joint European Japanese mission or something like that that would allow to continue and enhance you know what we have already out there. So that is the um, one effort that we've been very heavily involved in. Many people in this building actually are. Um, now, so this of course, that, that's kind of a boilerplate thing, and I hope you didn't fall for that. Uh, show of hands, who really thinks that's true? That's important? No one, great. Because um, really what you have to do is you have to think small, and you have to think inside the box. Right. So, and that is the other thing I've been involved in, and um, this here is a Q-tip, and this, this is really fun science, and I'm not really sure where it's going right now, but it's completely orthogonal to all these very big missions, even Earth Venture missions, which are small compared to the big NASA missions, they, they would count as being big compared to this, because this little box here, and you have to think, put something inside there, this little box is like that size, it's like 10 times 10 times 10 centimeters, right? It's tiny, yeah, it's a nano satellite. So um, we, we came up with this, uh, this little CubeSat observation system for meteorological and climate sciences. And it is, so, so this here is the battery pack in there, right? And these rods here, they align it passively to the Earth magnetic field so that it doesn't wobble around too much. It kind of stays in, stays in shape. Now the problem with this CubeSat thing though is you really have to think hard to find real science of the it's great, it's very, very cheap. You know, you can you can command it with amateur radio stuff, so we could easily run, you know, CubeSat, you know, experiment out of Wisconsin, and uh, I'm gonna tell you how cheap it is, just say. Um, but then, you know, doing real science with it, that is hard. The thing that we were proposing is, we are proposing a CubeSat flying around here, right, and then you switch it on, and then on that CubeSat there is a beacon, a 10 gigahertz beacon, pretty much, Rain, free, rain radar frequency type of beacon. If you could then receive the signal strength down here, you know, as the CubeSat flies through precipitation, you would measure attenuation through your precipitation. There would be information about precipitation that you could actually probably calibrate accurately enough that you can do some real science with that. And it would fit on that small satellite all in terms of power and in terms of weight. And then you would kind of switch it off once, you know, shortly before it leaves the, uh, the range. Uh, yeah, the antenna ring. So that's something that we have proposed um, to NSF. Uh, there is there is many other things that you potentially could do with these cu with these cubesats. You know, low risk proof of concept type of missions. It's hard for the very small ones to fit full instruments on there. That's difficult. Now the mission cost is incredibly cheap. Like for GPM, for the cost of the GPM core satellite, you could fly 500 cubesats. So that, that one mission we're proposing is like $3 million, including building the instrument, including launch, it. now launch is not included, that is provided by NASA, but including like one year of operations and everything. So, you know, even for an Earth carrier, for an Earth venture type of mission, you could fly like 30 cubes. Um, you know, you have very short timeline, maybe a few years to launch, and you, you can run it, operate it out of any university, which I think is very exciting. Uh, that is the hard part, you know. You have to deal with space and power limitations, and it's very, very difficult to design exciting, you know, cutting-edge science missions with that. So, to recap, we have this here, and, and that is something that, that that somehow we should think about doing something with. Uh, and and you know, everyone has a good idea. I, I'd be very happy to hear that. And then the other thing is in terms of bigger picture satellite missions. I think it's very, very important we think about as community what is going to happen after GPM? How do we leverage off all the really very important and, and good experiences we made with CloudSat and GPM and Trim? And I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Ralph and Laura Mark. Want to stand up? Yeah.
and questions will uh, you know, continue and people will hunt each other down. 